Lone Star Steakhouse was once a thriving nationwide chain, so how did the Bloomin' Onion help seal its demise? Lone Star Steakhouse was created in the late 80s by restaurateur Jamie Coulter. It wasn't his first rodeo. As a young entrepreneur based in Wichita, Kansas, Coulter and two friends began franchising Pizza Hut restaurants in the 1960s. After opening over 170 Pizza Hut locations and expanding his scope to include KFC franchises, Coulter established Coulter Enterprises. Then, in late 1989, Coulter was invited to take a look at a new prototype restaurant, the Lone Star Steakhouse and Saloon. The prototype for Lone Star was developed by the company Creative Culinary Concepts. The food was meant to emulate the mesquite grill pits that became popular in Texas in the late 19th century. The decor and ambiance drew inspiration from the boisterous western-style roadhouses of yore, only with a lot less brawling. Coulter saw potential and went into business with Creative Culinary Concepts in 1991. Within seven months, Coulter opened four additional Lone Star units. The early Lone Star Steakhouses specialized in mesquite grilling with a menu that featured a variety of steaks, barbecue ribs, chicken, and a seafood option. Each location measured 6,000 square feet and could seat up to 200 customers at a time. But Coulter, a man who was used to overseeing a small army of Pizza Hut locations, wasn't satisfied with just a few Lone Star units. Coulter incorporated Lone Star Steakhouse in 1992. That year, Lone Star became a publicly traded company in the stock market. At the time it went public, there were eight locations, with each unit generating roughly $2.5 million in annual sales. The stock offering was a smash hit. By 1996, the total number of Lone Star Steakhouse locations had grown significantly and showed no signs of slowing. But as casual steakhouses began popping up everywhere, the market was becoming oversaturated. It could be said that Texas Roadhouse mimicked a lot of what Lone Star Steakhouse helped make mainstream. Texas Roadhouse opened in Clarksville, Indiana in 1993, right on the heels of Lone Star's inception. Over the years, it became hard to distinguish between them. Now, the main difference is that Texas Roadhouse is thriving and Lone Star has vanished. When I'm hungry for the great steak of Texas, I always go to the Texas Roadhouse. That's in large part because Lone Star Steakhouse's brand identity wasn't exactly original. The once popular Ponderosa and Bonanza Steakhouses came about in the 60s and sported a heavy-handed country-western vibe. Likewise, Longhorn Steakhouse has been around since 1981, and although it doesn't sally forth with gimmicks like line dancing on a peanut shell-covered floor, it too celebrates old-school Texas grill culture. The early years of Lone Star were truly the halcyon days of the steakhouse. In 1993, 1994, and 1995, Forbes magazine named Lone Star Steakhouse the best small company in America. By the end of 1995, Lone Star's total restaurant count had reached 182 locations. Coulter decided to begin exploring expansion options beyond the Lone Star name. In 1996, he opened Sullivan Steakhouse as a more upscale experience. And then he made a power move, purchasing Del Frisco's Double Eagle Steakhouse for $23 million in cash and stock. Del Frisco's Double Eagle represented the upscale tier of steakhouses. It was the top-earning restaurant in all of Texas in 1995, with $12 million in sales. With two new ventures in a higher end of the steakhouse market, Coulter had his hands full, and Lone Star wasn't the center of attention anymore. One of Lone Star's biggest competitors was Outback Steakhouse. The Australian-themed eatery got its start in Tampa, Florida in 1988. Lone Star and Outback rose to prominence at almost the same time and offered near-identical items on their respective menus. One area where Outback outshone Lone Star, though, was marketing. From the beginning, both chains sold a breaded and deep-fried onion appetizer with a creamy dipping sauce. Lone Star failed to nail down an exact name for its savory starter. It was originally called the Texas Tumbleweed, and at some point was known as the Texas Rose. Outback called its version the Bloom and Onion and ran a series of advertisements so successful that the dish is today a singular must-try item on the Outback Steakhouse menu. Oh, you know what I could go for? Bloom and Onion. You in? By the early 2000s, the budget steakhouse arena was utterly oversaturated, and the sales of former top-performing chains began to decline. Outback pivoted with ease, having diversified through sister brands like Caraba's Italian Grill and Bonefish Grill. Since these restaurants were far enough removed from the steakhouse space, they performed well and helped Outback weather the storm. Lone Star had a couple of sister restaurants too, but they were also steakhouses. The lack of variety failed to provide a safety net, something Lone Star would end up desperately needing. 
Restaurant sales were steady into the late 90s, but Lone Star's stock market performance was abysmal despite a wildly positive stock market. There are a couple of reasons why this happened. In an attempt to maintain its existing profit margins, Lone Star scaled back on advertising and raised its menu prices — not exactly the best move to get more people through the door. And poor reviews of their food hurt the brand. Lone Star's problems in the stock market were made worse by the fact that Coulter had sold off 1.2 million of his Lone Star shares in the spring of 1996, when the the stock price was $44 a share, a company high. Four years later, that price would plummet a shocking 85%, making it all worth less than $7 a share at the start of the millennium. The California Public Employees Retirement System, a company then with over 372,000 shares of Lone Star stock, sued Coulter in 2001. The lawsuit indicated that while stock prices nosedived, Coulter and another board member had quadrupled their earnings and padded their future severance agreements. In 2001, the board voted to replace Coulter as chairman, but it didn't help, and Lone Star's sales dropped by $1.14 million in 2002. Years of stock market instability and fluctuating sales motivated Lone Star's desire to return to the private sector. Four years after a failed merger with a private equity firm, Lone Star Steakhouse was bought out in 2006 by Lone Star Fund, a group that specialized in buying hurting businesses and acquired Lone Star for roughly $600 million. By retreating into the private sector, Lone Star could address its issues away from the ever-scrutinizing eye of Wall Street. But shareholders weren't happy, as they felt the chain and its sister restaurants had been sold too cheaply. After the buyout, LSF attempted to modernize Lone Star's dated rodeo look. It also rolled out plans to take Sullivan's and Del Frisco's public in hopes of geographic expansion. A $100 million IPO was filed in October 2007, leaving Lone Star in the dust. The Great Recession hit hard in December 2007, putting businesses of all kinds under serious pressure. In the wake of this mass economic hardship, many Americans scaled back on higher quality foods and what they viewed as frivolous expenditures, like dining out. Lone Star was still regaining its bearings after exiting the stock market and going private, and the recession proved to be a seriously harmful blow to the vulnerable business. Lone Star announced in February 2008 that it would close 26 locations due to performance-related issues, and in 2008, nine, they closed 27 more locations. As the restaurant industry battled back in those early post-recession years, Lone Star continued to flounder. September 2010 saw another 19 unprofitable units close, dwindling Lone Star's remaining restaurant count to just 112 in 31 states. Most of the locations that said goodbye during this time had been in business since the mid-1990s. Several of Lone Star's former restaurant buildings were converted into other casual sit-down spots, while others sat empty for years. Between its 2000s-era boardroom squabbles and shambolic dealings in the stock market, Lone Star had been on its knees for years. The decision to go private in 2006 could have breathed renewed life into the once-superstar chain, yet the Great Recession eviscerated those chances. From there, it was all downhill. Crowded as the casual steakhouse market was, numerous long-standing chains like Outback Steakhouse, Longhorn Steakhouse, and Texas Roadhouse fared well post-recession. Lone Star, on the other hand, folded again and again. After 2010, many franchisees began to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. In 2013, LSF agreed to sell Lone Star and its sibling eatery Texas Land and Cattle to the Daystar Restaurant Group. The deal meant Daystar would inherit all 27 Texas Land and Cattle units and Lone Star's last 78 outposts. Daystar had high hopes for hitting the refresh button on these bedraggled brands, but it just didn't happen. At least 14 Lone Star locations closed without notice by 2016's end, including the original restaurant in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Then, one of Daystar's co-founders stepped down due to disagreements over the company's trajectory. Closures and bankruptcy filings continued into 2017, leaving the majority of Lone Star Steakhouse locations replaced, demolished, or abandoned. During its history, Lone Star's only true international locations were the 12 it opened in Australia in the 90s. They were sold in 2003 and didn't survive long after that. So it may come as a surprise to learn that the only remaining Lone Star Steakhouse still operating in the world is actually located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the U.S. territory Guam. It's a long way to go for a Texas-style steak, yet the Lone Star Steakhouse in Guam appears to be alive and well. With just one unit to maintain, Lone Star Guam continues to serve a slice of Southern hospitality to the people of Micronesia at a level of quality that keeps the seats full. According to TripAdvisor, the Lone Star Steakhouse location in Guam has an overall four-star review and ranks number two out of the restaurants there. 
I've gotten comments about, wow, this place reminds me of home. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Lone Star's fire may have burned out in mainstream America, but at least it hasn't been extinguished for good. In its heyday, Lone Star was a leader of the casual steakhouse pack, but for now, an enduring presence in Guam remains the true Lone Star.